Welcome back to the Perfected Health Podcast. This is episode seven with Mike, aka Heal Your Gut Guy. Today we are going to talk about the gut microbiome. Mike, can you let them know a little bit about what you do? Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Mike, the Heal Your Gut Guy, and I have a YouTube channel where I show people how to heal their gut 100% naturally without drugs, whether you're dealing with IBS, Crohn's, colitis, candida, SIBO, anything gut related, I want to help you guys out. I, I suffered from really bad Crohn's and, and candida, couldn't tolerate, um, you know, I, I strive to eat a Weston A. Price diet and I couldn't eat those things like sourdough bread and stuff like that. And I just kept at it until I could bring those foods back into my diet. And you know, I was on a carnivore type diet for a long time, but, um, yeah, that's, that's essentially what I, what I've done. I bought in candida from a lab and like tested it at home, like with different antifungals. So like, I'm a real nerd about this stuff and yeah. So yeah, that's, that's a little about me. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with the Weston Price style diet, uh, he was a dentist who went around in the early 1900s, explored various indigenous groups. And the premise for these diets is just very, very high quality heirloom grains, mm -hmm. wild plants, quality animal foods. Uh, but just to give people some context, everyone always asks, you know, what's the gut microbiome? People are always referring to foods as being good for your gut. Why is this so important? And is the general idea about the gut microbiome misunderstood? Yeah, the, the, the gut microbiome is kind of like overwhelming when you think about it. You know, you have like all these different millions of species of nematodes and fungi and bacteria, you know, like how are you supposed to like, you can't even, even if you had like a list of everything of the millions of things that are going to be in your gut, like how would you manage that? It's like, mm -hmm. it's like impossible. So I, I do my best to, to try to you know, look at what our ancestors did, you know, how, how does mother, I, I always, when I have like these huge daunting questions like this, I always look to mother nature, you know, how does, how do most mammals establish their gut microbiome? Mm -hmm. They, they do it with raw dairy, you know, mm -hmm. with, with mother's milk. And, and um, so, yeah, it's, and it's really interesting because there's this like, for example, candida is just labeled this, it's a bad guy. Mm -hmm. It's, it's a little bit more, it's, it's a dimorphic fungus, which means it can transform between a single celled fungus, which is a yeast, and then a multicellular organism, a fungus. Mm -hmm. So candida is both a, a good and a bad guy. So it, it gets out of control when it morphs into its fungal form. And even, mm -hmm. even bacteria like lactobacillus can be pathogenic. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's more about creating a good environment in your gut, an environment that the good guys love and the bad guys literally cannot exist in because it, it's, you'll, it's kind of like star Wars, like the light and the dark side, like you, you create like, this environment where the good guys thrive and the bad guys literally cannot exist or they, they change their behavior to be, become, become good. It's like tuberculosis, E. coli, they all behave the same way. They all change their behavior depending on their environment. So the first thing you have to do is, is get the environment under control. So our ancestors had a very specific gut microbiome that was created based on essentially their native environment. You know, the, mm -hmm. their parents were eating specific foods that had certain nutrients, certain bacterial contents. Mm -hmm. They received their mother's milk that had a certain bacterial profile, certain nu nutrient content, depending on their environment. And now we are in an unnatural environment that's creating mm -hmm. an unnatural microbiome that is not conducive to human health. So we basically have to say, okay, how, to, how do we get our gut microbiomes to this ancestral, to this indigenous state of health? Uh, speaking of candida, I was, you know, I commonly reread this study that zinc deficiency induces hyperadherent uh, Goliath candida, you know, when, when oh, there's wow. an excess of copper. So the morphology and how these bacteria can change, it, it gets so complicated and interesting, especially considering, you know, if you have, you can try to specify what type of bacteria it is, you know, is it bifidum? Is it lactobacillus? Is it strep? Is it staph? But even under each of those bacterial categories, you have 
thousands and thousands of different types of strains yeah. and they all behave yeah. differently. And, and it just gets so overwhelmingly complicated that you really can't address it outside of a natural context because when you mm -hmm. do take one of these natural foods like raw milk, like a fermented animal product, they have this native, this indigenous bacteria profile almost naturally. And most people don't have this healthy gut microbiome. And yeah. before we actually address how to heal these gut issues, I mean, obviously some people know they have gut issues, but are, are there any things that aren't as obvious? So there's, okay, so that's funny that you use the word obvious. So there's something, it's very obvious, but it's like no, no one acknowledges it. So we're all trying to heal or cure our guts. We, and we don't really, you know, we're in such a hurry. We don't really stop to think what those words actually mean. Mm -hmm. um, so the word heal has Germanic origins and it means to make whole again. So we need to, like, how do we make our gut whole again? You know, eat the nutrients that our gut is made of so our body can do that. What does the word cure means? It means to take care of. It's, it has Latin origins from a curare, to take care of. So we need to take care of our gut. And when you look at IBS, Crohn's, colitis, literally it's like just your doctor telling you you have an inflamed gut. Mm -hmm. And it's like if you get punched in the nose and your doctor comes up to you and he says, you have nositis. It's like you just have an inflamed nose. It means you have it. Inflammation is your body's response to injury. So if something is inflamed, it's not the inflammation causing the issues, it's the injury causing the issues. Mm -hmm. So I, like, I don't even like to call gut disease gut disease. I, I, hate, I hate the terms colitis and IBS. It's literally just an injured gut and you're doing something to injure your gut. And infection's a big part of that. But so the root cause of all gut disease, all, all gut, like pain, if you have gut pain, why does, a, why does any body part experience pain? It doesn't, it's injury. It's the only, the only thing that can cause pain is some sort of injury. So I've outlined, I found like 15, 16 different ways someone could injure, injure their gut. And you, and you can do this with like water. You can injure your gut with even, even meat, even with the easiest to digest foods like meat, you can injure your gut. So people are fixated on healing their gut, but they haven't even identified the underlying issue, what actually caused the damage in the first place. Mm -hmm. and, and this could be something like, you know, a mineral imbalance, uh, heavy metal toxicity. Uh, those are mm -hmm. things that aren't usually as common. It could be, you know, an underlying moderate inflammatory food they're consuming. So a lot of what I speak about, and a lot of what I focus on is based around the carnivore diet. So uh, mm -hmm. we do want to talk about how to heal your gut specifically on carnivore and, and then kind of how people can branch out to other foods and really give people some context and understanding of how far you can push the boundaries of what food you're able to consume once you actually heal your gut, once you actually have that healthy gut microbiome. Yeah, so I think it's nice to first kind of have like a goal in mind. And I think your goal should be to strive towards that Weston A. Price dietary principles. and. And literally, they ate food. They ate the most nutrient-dense foods uh, possible in an easy-to-digest format. They deactivated plant toxins, and you know they ate organ meats. And you know, there's we can get we can talk about that forever. But that's like they ate like normal foods. They were they're just prepared differently, and they were grown on nutrient-dense soils. But um, yeah, starting off with the carnivore diet, it's it's a so I really, really focus on digestibility. And when you look at carnivore animals, they just have, they have a lot simpler digestive systems than, than herbivore animals. Mm -hmm. And if you look at, like chickens are pretty carnivorous, but they eat a lot of plant foods. And if you go look at their digestive system, you'll see the hardware for them to, to digest plants. Mm -hmm. And so we're like a little bit more complex than like, if you compare us to a dog or a cat, our colon is slightly bigger, mm -hmm. but nowhere near the size of a monkey. And, but mm -hmm. you look at different monkeys. I mean, all monkeys are species of monkeys are different. The, there's some that eat lots of bugs and stuff. So, but when we look at meat, um, 
you know, there's a spectrum of digestibility. I mean, I'm sure we've all had a well done burger and it sits in your stomach like a stone. Mm -hmm. Like that is not easy to digest. So there's, there's, so here, here's a question for you guys. Why is eating salmon raw kind of like a normal thing and eating something like beef is, you know, there's beef tartare and, you know, a lot of carnivore people are eating, you know, raw beef, but it's, it's not culturally normal. And this is because uh, beef is, is tough. It is tough. If you, if you go outside and you whack a cow over the head and you try to eat it right then and there, you, you would be able to eat the organs, but the muscle meat, you will break your teeth. You will yeah, break you can your eat the teeth. fat, you could eat the brains, you could eat yeah. certain parts, but most of the muscle meat, what people don't realize on any ruminant animal, you can't actually eat it without heavily cooking it. It's super tough. And even if you were to cook it right there, it would still be tough. So what they, you go to a crappy grocery store that meat, the ground beef or whatever is hanging in there has been hanging for at least two weeks and it's yeah. still tough. That usually um, at least two, three months in a lot of cases by the time yeah. it gets to your plate. Yep. So, and, and the reason why beef is tough is because it's, it's a huge animal. Like, um, I think Frank's working out right now. So Frank's biceps are harder than mine. So like if we <laughs> had, so if, if we were to serve, Frank's bicep on a plate, his, his biceps would be tougher than mine because it's, you know, the, the muscle fibers are hard. A fish is in a weightless environment. So certain cuts of meat on the fish are going to be very, very tender and easy to digest. And that's, that's why people eat a lot of, a lot of fish raw and they don't eat a lot of these huge herbivores raw and, mm -hmm. and chickens easier to digest be, just because, you know, you can kill a chicken and eat it right then and there just because they're not carrying around a ton of weight. Um, this makes a lot of sense. And this is something that people overlook. I, I think this ties into the mineral profile of the food and the nutrient mm -hmm. profile and how that changes based on how old the animal is, how big the animal is, what it's been eating is probably mm -hmm. what actually affects this digestion. But when you do look at the human digestive system in the context of that very simplistic digestibility, every single thing humans have done to their food in any single preparation is to make the food easier to digest. You know, whether mm -hmm. you're fermenting wheat to make sourdough bread, you're cooking meat to break it down, any fermentation and any preferred foods like sugar, honey, glucose, fructose, fruit, stuff that's very easily absorbed, you're basically looking at what is the simplest input to the human digestive system that gives me the most amount of nutrients, the most amount of mm -hmm. calories. And, mm -hmm. and an example would be I mean, someone on a vegan diet consuming these very fibrous, tough to digest plant foods that other ruminants are better equipped for. That's mm -hmm. the contrast. Human digestive system, simple. Basically, ideally, everything is baby food. You know, mm -hmm. herbivore, ruminant digestive system, very complex. You could essentially eat a piece of wood almost. That's, yeah, that's a little dramatic, but that's a pretty good analogy. I mean, it's, it's really cool looking at different digestive systems. Like you can look at bugs and you know terminites they actually eat woods uh, it's 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 really cool so a lot of people talk about there's there's this big debate right now in the carnivore community community whether raw meat or cooked meat is easier to digest and it and it really depends on what it is sometimes cooked meat is easier to digest sometimes raw meat is easier to digest um you know and a lot of people are eating these high meats and power to you if you can eat them, but I, I can't eat them. I like, they're just, <laughs> but we have a, a more palatable way to do that. And it's mm -hmm. called curing and fermenting meats, you know, mm -hmm. uh, things like um, Genoa salami and uh, just prosciutto. Raw, raw cheeses in the supermarket. Yeah, exactly. There's, um, when we look at Weston A. Price's Weston A. Price's book is awesome. And we have to keep in mind, it was written in the 1930s. And there was a lot of things that didn't exist. The refrigerator didn't exist. And so there's probably, when he's talking about meat, he's probably, like, you have to realize back then, curing meat, salting meat, and hanging meat in your kitchen and doing all that stuff, that was normal. So he probably mm -hmm. didn't even mention it. There was, yeah. there was no refrigerators back then. It was like this totally, like the culture of, like they were eating a ton of their meats um, in this 
fermented broken down process. It's, it's, it's so much easier to digest. I mean, they were doing, um, they were cooking and, you know, doing this curing process. But one thing I want to say about cooking is, um, it's what makes meat hard to digest that well, that well done steak. It's, it's when you boil the water out of the, the chemistry, the, the molecules of the meat. So, um, you know, water boils around 200 degrees Fahrenheit. And if you, if you cook that meat too hot, literally the, the water leaves the molecular structure and the structure just collapse and becomes a rock. Mm-hmm. So it's all, it's all about doing that slow, that nice slow roast where it becomes stringy, that pulled pork where it just like, you can just cut it with your fork and it melts in your mouth. Mm-hmm. Like that is like the ultimate pre-digested meat for me and i and i like to use marinades like um like a kiwi or a papaya marinade it has uh enzymes in it that will that will break the um the protein bond so it's all about getting it you know breaking breaking down those proteins and having your body do as less less work as possible so that's the caloric input that is easier to digest. You know, when we, mm-hmm. when we ferment the food, when we break it down, when we cook it in a certain way. Now, what about, you know, the, the bacterial profile that's conducive to those foods? What role does that play in, in the raw versus the fermented versus the cooked foods? Um, I mean, it's pretty interesting when you, when, when you like talk about meat and the gut microbiome, because it's, it's, um, you know, bacteria really doesn't flourish in the presence of meat. It, 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 it needs starch, it needs glucose, it needs, it needs sugar for their populations to explode. Um, that, that's something I don't understand too much. It'd be really interesting to look at like a dog or a cat's gut microbiome. And, you know, just like the populations or maybe they're, you know, they're totally different in animals that eat a lot of starch. Is but, it, um, I guess this would explain why when you take an indigenous group like the First Nation Alaskans, they used to eat predominantly meat as a base of their diet, but mm-hmm. they consumed around half a pound to a quarter of a pound of fermented rotten meat every day to get that bacteria. But when we look at other indigenous groups that didn't consume as much fermented meat, they seem to have more carbohydrates present in the diet, probably to replicate that back because they're, they're feeding the bacteria instead of actually consuming the bacteria possibly. Well, yeah, well, th- that's, that's really interesting. That, then that's, some, that's a question I've wrestled with quite a bit. So when we, when we look at Weston A. Price's work, pretty much everyone but the Eskimos had, had some sort of starch, whether it was some sort of tuber, some sort of grain, where they're in the tropics eating tr- tubers and fruits. And then you get to, like even the, um, the Plains Indians, they were, they were eating tubers and and trading for corn and stuff like that. Then, then you get up north, and the only sugar source that I'm aware of is glycogen from the fat. And I, I haven't. I guess you could ferment with that. Like your, the bacteria could live off of that. And then blood. Those are your two sugar sources up from there. a freshly killed animal. Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. And and it's the blubber from sea mammals. They they store glycogen in their fat so they, they can stay underwater for long. long this is interesting because you have the glycolytic enzymes, the fat hydrolyzing enzymes, and the proteolytic enzymes in meat that actually start breaking down that glycogen once the animal dies. It's into oh, lactic, so you, into so lactic you acid. eat it really fast. Yeah, okay. so, so once, once that meat starts fermenting, I would, I would guess you know, after about 24 to 48 hours of that animal being slaughtered, the meat loses its glycogen content. No so if way, you, if you did kill. Yeah, if you did kill a, a freshly, you know, if you have a fresh mammal, a fresh seal, and you eat that liver, there's going to be glycogen. But, you know, there were periods of probably weeks to months where they didn't slaughter a fresh animal, for sure. Well, I, well this, I just thought of this just now. Um, when, so when they, were eating, when they were eating these animals, they also ate whatever was in their guts. Mm-hmm. They did. And, that's, that's, and correct, that, that's, yeah. that's a, I mean, what's a better probiotic than that? You're eating you know, there's bacteria eating the seaweed or whatever is in their gut or the caribou's eating the moss and the back and they're eating that. That's like, that's like kimchi, but your fermentation jar is like the guts of. Yeah. I'm curious why, I'm curious why that isn't brought up more often because 
you know, when they kill those ruminant animals or that, that seal, they were actually dipping the contents of their gut in like fat and they were eating it as part of their meals. Yeah. That's and, something and that, I, yeah. And I think they always ate cause they needed, they needed plant foods cause there was literally nothing up there so that they needed, um, uh, for whatever reason, I mean, uh, and I think they really made a point. I, I think you've read uh, the the guy's Ferguson's book. Who's 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 up in the north? Have you read his book? Vilyamir Stephenson. Yeah, uh, yeah. Land. Mm-hmm. I haven't read that, so I'd be interested to see what he if he, if there's anything about that in there. They were eating a lot of rotten meat, a lot of fermented meat, and and the only speculation that we really have for certain is that in order to repopulate their gut microbiomes in that carnivorous arctic temperature they were consuming large amounts of fermented meat every single day so it's safe to say yeah that if you decide to follow a carnivore diet if you want to be in good health you have Mm -hmm. to essentially eat rotten meat because there's there's never been a society of people that has subsisted off of meat without the presence of carbohydrates Mm -hmm. or without the presence of rotten meat and that's Mm -hmm. why i don't really think you know this carnivore diet long term without proper food ratios, proper food preparation is something that people should be doing. Uh, I, I totally agree with you. It's um, like for me, I, I did specific carbohydrate diet, GAPS diet. And, you know, I felt great. You know, when you first on that diet, the first couple of weeks, you're like, I'm never eating carbs again, mm-hmm. you know. And then a year later, two years later, I mean, if you see a piece of bread and you just like black out and there's like crumbs all over your face. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's, I mean, I, I eat, you know, I, I look at Weston A. Price's work as kind of like my, my guidelines and they were eating starch with everything. I mean, starch was a huge part of their meals de- depending on where they were. So, um, but I do use a lot of carnivore principles, like a low sugar diet when I, when I go to heal the gut, because I, I want to keep the sugar low. So the bacteria populations are, are low and they don't have a lot of food and their defenses are down. And when, and when they don't have food, when they, when they don't have sugar, they're super weak. They're, mm-hmm. they're um, like, so for example, say you put oregano oil on fed candida, it might live mm-hmm. because it has resources. Mm-hmm. You, you put oregano oil on candida that's been starved for a week uh, or for months it's, it's not going to have, it's, it's probably going to die because it's, it's, it's super weak. It's on its last leg. Mm-hmm. Um, and it just makes it that much easier to bring in, you know, probiotics when you bring in probiotics. So, so we have that general kind of summary and, and ideas pinpointed around the carnivore diet. So let's say we do have a gut issue. We need to fix things. What would you say the steps of the protocol are? Obviously you want to remove any potentially negative pathogenic bacteria you want to address the underlying issues. You want to let that gut heal, uh, mm-hmm. you know, with the proper nutrients, and then what well, you want to replenish with the beneficial flora. But this is a lot easier said than done. Yeah. So I like our, our protocol is kind of broken down into three phases. The first phase, you're really just trying, like the the gut's on fire. It's freaking out. It's inflamed, and that's because you're injuring it. So it's it's identifying those sources of injury and, and stopping it as much as you can, whether it's, you know, eating whole grains or, or something, you know, eating vegetable oils, you know, those sorts of things. And once it's under control, you can start sealing the gut, whether it's with uh, meat stock and just eating super easy to digest foods. And then from that point, when, once you're feeling good, because what I see a lot of people do is their gut will still be all crazy and super hurt and bleeding and stuff like that. And then they go right, they jump right into infection fighting, which is not what you want to do because all those, you, once you kill those guys, they're going to go, those toxins are going to go in your bloodstream and it's going to suck. So it's, you know, you stop injuring your gut. Um, you seal your gut. You, you disinfect your gut. And then you, you kind of disinfect and reculture at the same time. And then after that, it's kind of, that's when I kind of like to think of it like as a broken leg. Once you get your broken leg out of a cast, you're not like, all right, I'm going to go run a marathon. You, you, go, you go into rehab and you slowly, you know, you bring in 
Um, I, I really focus on digestibility of different foods. So I, I make sure like I put two foods in front of you, you're going to know which one's easier to digest. Mm -hmm. And so you, you know, you eat this for, you just slowly test your digestive capabilities. That's, and it's, it's really how you heal a broken arm, how you heal a broken leg. It's just, you're dealing with the gut. It's a, it's a little bit, you just have to understand the digestibility of the food. That's like mm -hmm. this. Like if you eat something hard to digest, that's like jumping up and down with a broken leg mm -hmm. versus having your leg in a cast or being in a wheelchair. Mm -hmm. That's, that's the equivalent of fasting. Yeah, there's clearly a lot of, uh, there's a lot of mistakes that can be made across every one of these steps. You know, if you're in a position where you're still maybe cheating on your diet once or twice a week, still yeah. eating foods that you shouldn't have, you're never going to potentially remove the inflammatory aspects from your diet. And mm -hmm. then let's, let's say you are that person that can stick to a strict carnivore diet you know, for a period of weeks to months or whatever it is, some people go crazy with the protocol and they damage their gut even further. They're messing around with yeah. too many supplements, too many antimicrobials, doing too many negative things. And then when you do go to repopulate your gut, people aren't repopulating with the right foods, the quality foods. And, and then any, at any point during this phase, it's very easy for people to relapse into that initial diet that was causing them issues in the first place. And I think a large percentage of people do get stuck in this vicious cycle of you know, not taking a step back, not looking at what you're doing, not really seeing how your body responds to things mm -hmm. and, and understanding what needs to be done every step of the way. It's well, it, so I was always eating, you know, since I read Weston A. Price's book, I was always eating Weston A. Price foods and, and whatnot. And even, but even on even eating strictly meat, you can injure your gut simply by eating too much or not chewing your food, like things mm -hmm. like this. And um, have you, have you heard of a uh, William Beaumont, uh, Dr. Beaumont? So this, this guy was really cool. So back in the 1850s, uh, he was a doctor and one of his, this one guy came to him, like he got shot in the chest. And so it left like a hole in his chest and, and a hole right into his stomach. And he nursed this guy's back, this guy back to health. And he had a whole, when they put the in stakes in his stomach and they saw how yeah, to get digested. The, yeah. And so yeah, I, I, I heard about this. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's like amazing. If he put like a chunk of steak in his, in his stomach, his stomach would like freak out and be like, Oh, I can't, I can't, like, I can't do this. But if you put ground beef into his stomach, then all his stomach, his stomach would just be like, Oh, okay, I can handle this. And so it's, it's, and you, you, it's, it's kind of like the sixth sense you develop. It's like, um, you know, I, like I, if I eat a, piece of well done meat like i feel it in seconds it's just like mm -hmm. like it, it just feels like a rock so yeah it's 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 really important to eat those grass-fed you know 100 percent grass-fed meats i mean you can eat the best food in the world but if you're not aware of what you're doing like if you're not always asking yourself what did i do to injure my gut you're gonna go in circles forever because that, that's what i was doing for two or three years and it wasn't until I understood like what is injuring my gut. And it was usually because I was eating too much mm -hmm. or not chewing my food. Like that, that's uh, like, that sounds silly, but that, that, that's what it was for, for a lot of these things. Yeah. This opens up the can of worms. That is all of the modern issues with our food supply right now. You know, if someone started a meat based diet or, or just a low inflammatory diet, but they're still consuming, you know, grain fed meat that has agrochemicals, atrazine, you know, farm raised fish that has various pollutants in it you know, your body might just not be able to deal with, you know, what you're ingesting from an antioxidant perspective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and that's, that's another thing we look at. So there's kind of two secrets, two big secrets to healing, avoiding injury and promoting healing. And so let me see if I can get my hand right on here. Okay. So like, if you're here, this is like your injured gut, like pretend this is like a graph and you need to get all the way over here to heal like you only heal very slowly. Like think of you, like the cells in your body are rearranging molecules and cells and, you know, building you back together. It's super slow. And you probably only heal when you sleep and then you do one stupid thing. Boom. You're like back down to square one. And like, you can literally hurt, injure yourself every single meal. And you only heal like this much in one, in one day. And when you get hurt, you go further and further back. Mm -hmm. It's, it's literally just like the most important thing. Like you could be doing a million things to promote healing. You could be getting tons of sun, eating the best 
cows and eating emu oil and yada yada. You could do oxygen therapy. You could be doing all that stuff, but it it absolutely does not matter if you keep if you continue to injure your gut. It's it's that that's just how the universe is. I like it. And yeah. So where does and, fasting play into this? If I mean, obviously, fasting can be a bad thing. Fasting can be a good thing, depending on what situation you're in and what your issue is. Yeah. So fasting is the ultimate way to rest your gut. You know, it's absolutely doing like, so if you have like a broken leg, it's being in a cast and it being in a wheelchair, but you know, we have to use our our gut. So, you know, fasting allows it to completely rest, but with a lot of people with gut diseases, they're already super malnourished. And so doing like a week water fast, you know, isn't ideal. So we kind of have people do um, like intermittent fasting, you know, where they stop eating after eight o'clock or something like that. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, it's, it's a way to let your gut rest. And we see it in religions. Like they usually have one fasting holiday and it's just, it's, you, you need to give your gut a rest. I mean, we put it under so much stress. I mean, it's, it's amazing that it's not more beat up than it already is. So it's fasting is just a way to rest your gut and doing those long-term fasts. It's, it's a way to rest your metabolism because and, and when I say metabolism, the word metabolism me it's it's the chemical the rate of chemical change in your body. So there's so so f- say for example I'm healing right now, and, you know it could be going like this fast when I have when there's food in my stomach and I'm to digesting food, and which is super laborious and taxing for your body even if you're digesting good food. Um, but if I'm fasting now my metabolic healing is going to be much faster. It's, it's all, it's, you know, it's matter cannot be created or destroyed. It's this con, you know, conserving energy and being very energy efficient, um, you know, with, with your bodily resources. Mm-hmm. It's, it's much like a business. So we have an idea of what needs to be done, but how does someone do this practically? Obviously, for that first step, it's a matter of, you know, removing the potential inflammatory foods. We want to make sure the nutrient density in the diet is adequate. So this means, I mean, literally, unfortunately, a carnivore diet is the baseline almost. If you're, if you're not consuming dairy, if you're not consuming eggs, you remove potential allergens. If the only foods you're consuming are, you know, wild caught fatty fish, high quality shellfish, pasture raised meats that type of stuff, there's really no negative in the diet that should potentially be inflaming the gut. Um, the, on, the only way that those foods could inflame the gut is if um, they're cooked like super well done, if they're not chewed properly, or if the person ate too much. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I, like, I, I tell people when they're first beginning, like, don't eat more than a cup of food. Like just, you have a broken leg. You you can't even, you can't even tiptoe around. Like we have to be like very reserved and very careful. Like you can eat more later when your gut is healed, but it's, it's broken. So even with, even with the high quality meats, I mean, it's, you know, like if you like beef is fine, but you just be aware beef is harder to digest than salmon. Mm -hmm. So, you know, do the math, see, see, see where your breaking point is, what's your threshold that that's, that's what I try to get people to start thinking about because most times like people will eat beef and they react to it and then they're like, Oh my God, I'm allergic to beef. It's just like, you, you can't be allergic to meat. It doesn't yeah. make any sense. Yeah. So if you have that high quality food and you keep the food volume in mind, as well as especially the cooking temperature and how you're chewing the food, mm-hmm. theoretically, mm-hmm. someone should be able to get to the point where they're able to then address the other issues, you know, do they need to mm-hmm. remove pathogenic bacteria? Do they need to repopulate their gut with certain, um, you know, certain probiotics? Now, this antimicrobial protocol is something that is way too complex to really go into. Uh, but mm-hmm. can you just give people an idea of, you know, what you're actually doing, what some of the common substances are that are used to, and, and what the typical period of time of using these antimicrobials is required? So 
I remember a while a, a while back, you, uh, you were talking about raw honey and and raw dairy, and how that that feeds candida. Mm-hmm. And but they're but they also are rumored to have antimicrobial po- properties. Mm-hmm. And so th- this is something I investigated. I I I bought candida. So my test was is I I had candida and I I put it like on a plate, and I put bread, and then I put like a big black mold of candida on there, and then I soaked the bread in yogurt or raw milk, different things. And candida took over every single time. Mm-hmm. I mean, unless it was a hundred percent honey, you know, it was like super dense honey, but I had, I had 75% honey and 25% water and candida's like, thanks for the sugar. Mm-hmm. Um, and I did 10 hour yogurt, 24 hour fermented yogurt. I did kefir and, and candida wins every single time. Um, raw milk products do ha- they do fight infection, but I, I like to think of those as a reculturing tool, mm-hmm. which which is really important for warding off infection. But it, it's not a good tool for like actually killing infection. Um, it's 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 more better to use uh, plant chemicals, herbs, herbs, and stuff like that. Um, and the and the way I like to I like the word this is. Um, Plants have been battling bat, bad bacteria and fungi since the dawn of time. And so they, they make these chemicals to, to fight them. Um, but you also have salts. Um, you have acidity. I, I, have, I have six natural disinfectants. Um, herbs, salts, uh, acidity, activated charcoal and clay. The, uh, activated charcoal is like... It's like magic. I've, I, I've seen lab studies where they run um, infected blood, like candida blood, through activated charcoal filters, and it'll pull out the candida and leave behind red blood cells. Like it, it doesn't make any sense. Like it's the coolest. <laughs> it's really cool. Um, and then iodine, um, and then raw dairy. But raw dairy should be used more as a reculturing tool. Um, yeah, it, it 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 just. It that's that that's and those things those six things that I just listed are are kind of in line with building that environment where the the bad guys can't exist because candida in its yeast form it, it lives in an acidic environment which is what our, our gut should be should be like around a four like a four um, and and if you like leave if if you leave candida alone with like a high population of candida and you leave it in an acidic environment they start joining hands and They'll, they'll change, they'll, they, they will change the pH. They'll start consuming food and building a pH. They'll start raising the pH of their environment and then, and then go full fungal. I, they're, they're, it's really cool. Like when you start looking at how these, how these guys behave. Yeah. What but, people have to understand, it's like, if you're trying to put raw milk or honey in, in a candida infected gut, it's like throwing a lighter in the ocean. It, yeah, yes, yeah, it's, yeah, it, exactly. it's, yeah. It's, it's, it can, it's technically, it should be countering it. But in regards to the actual volume, there, if there's any potential, potential positive benefit in whatever you're consuming to the candida, it will simply overtake the negative benefit and use that positive benefit. So even yeah. if honey exhibits an antimicrobial property, there's still sugar in the honey. Even if raw it's, milk- they, you know. they will eat the sugar. Yeah. It's, um, yeah. And, and so, we, so we use a, um, and it's, it's impossible to starve candida. You can starve it and weaken it. You cannot starve it and kill it. Mm-hmm. I, I've, I've like had candida in my bag, like in a bag, you know, in like a Ziploc bag. I won't feed it for months. I give it a piece of bread and it's back mm-hmm. to life. That, that, that's just what microorganisms do. They all do that. Um, so we know yeah, we it, have those, those six things that can be used to reduce the power of these microbes. But there are also probiotic microbes that, do counter certain organisms. Like I know there's Saccharomyces boulardii, which is known for inhibiting activity of candida cells. Yeah. I, so I, I'm, I'm kind of like a video game nerd. So I kind of like think of this, like I'm playing like Starcraft or Warcraft and like in, in the gut. And so what I like to do is I like to bomb the bad guys and then I send in my troops. Mm-hmm. So it's just, I mean, you could send in your troops and do it at the same time, but I mean, it, there's, 
I mean, just like Candida has its biofilms up, they've occupied the whole area. You, you really have to, you know, weaken them with starving them, cutting the supply lines, and then just throwing a light, orig- like you can literally kill them in two seconds if you get oregano oil to them. Mm-hmm. Like, like if you're cleaning mold on your kitchen counter, like you put bleach on it, it's dead right, right then and there. Mm-hmm. I mean, you don't want to do that in your gut, but um, you know, if you get the, the, you know, the herbs to the right location. And, and, and that's another thing because some people will take herbs on an empty stomach and it just gets, it just gets those, those chemicals get absorbed in your stomach and it goes into your bloodstream, which if you're fighting like Lyme or something, that's great. But you want to take a lot of these things with food. Mm-hmm. And then if your poop comes out smelling like oregano oil, you know, you, you hit everything. So, um, yeah, that's, I, I try to, I try to get people to think, like logically about it and like not overcomplicate it. Mm -hmm. And, and it's good to have like, cause there's like a lot of things. Like, I'm just like, I don't know if I could ever answer that question. It's like too complicated, but Mm -hmm. I try to find like all these facts that just kind of coming up with a plan around, around those facts that I know, like I know is a fact. So we're mindful of food quality. We're mindful of preparation, how we're consuming the food, how we're chewing it, all of those things. We, we know how to, potentially remove any pathogenic negative bacteria. Of course, you guys can Google. There's something that's called the Integrative SIBO Conference. Uh, If you look at the 2017 or 2018 notes, there's tons and tons and tons of antimicrobial protocols from various doctors that you guys can look into. And and this includes those antimicrobials, whether it's berberine, oregano oil. There's too many to list. I could probably list two dozen right now. You know, you have iodine. You can do salt flushes. There, there's so many MCT oil. There, there's just far too many things to list. We can't really go into that here. But now you're at the point, okay, you've been, you know, you removed the inflammation. The pathogenic bacteria is somewhat weak. What is the safest, most consistent way to repopulate the gut microbiome? I'm guessing it's like a proper culture of kefir or, or yogurt or something like that. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I mean, if you were to do it, you would buy human breast milk on the black market or something like that. But I mean, what, I mean, what have people been doing since they've been drinking milk? Um, you know, I, I even tried to look at how to like reptiles establish their gut microbiome. I couldn't, I couldn't find an answer for that, but birds, how do they do it? They eat cow poop. I think that's, I, I'm, I literally think chickens establish their gut microbiomes by eating, by eating cow, cow crap. Yeah, they eat the they, they eat the feces and then they like they vomit it up to their chicks, right? Mhm. Mhm. And if you think about it, you know, milk isn't far off from I know milk is a lot more tastier than poop, but it's it's kind of like the it's it's all from the same force. It's from it's it's from the gut bacteria. That's one the way soil to put it. Bacteria. They're both coming out of a cow, right? <laughs> yeah, it's it's coming out of a cow and like the source it is the gut. And so it's like kind of like this big you know, cycle. So it's, and, and I think you're, I mean, if, if you go back like a hundred years ago, like, I mean, that's why fecal transplants work in some cases. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But if you go back a hundred years ago, like you did not move much. You ate the same foods every single day. You know, you didn't have, I mean, like if you lived in the Swiss Valley, you ate rye bread and you ate milk. And so the bacteria in your gut they, they knew that those foods were coming down. So they just, they adapt to those foods. Now it's like you cross the street and you eat Chinese or Indian and there's 50 ingredients time. in one thing. Yeah. And like, how is your, like your gut adapts to your diet and kind of your diet today is like all over the place. Um, you know, just, you have so many options today. So it, it's, it's, it's kind of like that, but I mean, we have all these, these awesome fermented foods, uh, you know, fermented, even fermented cured meats. I mean, I think they're, depending on what you get there, CFU can be up there with, um, um, I don't know, things like yogurt and stuff like that. You can do fermented porridges. Those are huge in Africa and those are going to have the, those are going to be off the charts on CFU. But what's actually really interesting is raw milk is a horrible probiotic. It is absolutely terrible. Very low um, in b- beneficial bacteria. Very yes, low. very very low. And and usually what people are getting are flash flash chilled raw milk. This is milk that's been chilled really fast right before, right when it comes out of the cow. 
and and you have to do this otherwise it'll be sour by the time it gets to you um it's it's not even it's not even a probiotic um so you know it's a great food it's just not a i, I see a lot of people doing these raw milk cures and I, mm -hmm. I was victim of this too i you mm -hmm. know i drink like a gallon and a half of milk of flash chilled raw milk and um well, that, that's I, I, great I had, for I had zero probiotics. Yeah, that's great for glutathione synthesis. You know, raw milk yeah. has a lot of raw milk has a lot of B vitamins. It has vitamin C, very readily available to be converted for antioxidant capacities. Especially people that have a hard time with methylation. You drink a glass mm -hmm. of milk, you feel like a million bucks because of the easily yeah. available B vitamins. But what you guys have to understand is, if anything is beneficial from a probiotic standpoint, that means it has to have bacteria. It essentially has to be an aged or rotten food. Yeah, it's um, and 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 a, and a lot of the problems with you know people treat you know raw milk as this antimicrobial food. It, it will feed candida. Mm -hmm. It will if you have SIBO. It will. Um, we we we've been fostering stray kittens, and we do not give them raw milk. I mean, their stomachs just go Bleh. like mm -hmm. we have to kill the parasites and and stuff like that first. I was and, reading and, a a study on that where if lactose is present in the digestive system. Any pathogenic bacteria, or not any, but certain strains of bacteria actually prefer to switch over to lactose, and then they'll switch yeah. over to they'll switch over to the glucose after the lactose is depleted. Yeah, it's 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 like starch is like this huge, long, you know, big structure that needs a lot of digestion, but it's totally worth the energy. Lactose is just it's like super easy. It's only it's only one bond. Um, yeah, and and one thing, so when we look at the, the raw milk cures, I mean, they had like a hundred percent cure rate on these digestive issues. And, and now it's like a 0% mm -hmm. cure rate. And you have to remember when, when these people were, were doing the cures, antibiotics did not exist. So they, they weren't dealing with people who were, who had been on antibiotics. Um, and I also want to point out they weren't using a two milk. They weren't using Jersey and they weren't using Jersey milk. The, the fat in that milk is, I guess the fat molecules are bigger. And so it makes it a little bit harder to you, digest. You, you said A2, you mean A1 or do you mean they A2? Weren't using, they weren't using A2A2 milk. They what weren't using, they were using, they were using Holstein milk. They were using A1. They A1 were using milk. A1. So you're saying A2 yeah. is actually bad. Whereas most people think A2 is the better one. Yeah, yeah. That, that's another, yeah. Cause I, I was doing A2A2 milk. And you know, it's, it's fine. It's totally fine milk. It's just someone with an injured digestive system, the, the fat might be hard. The fat them. globules are larger in the yeah. A2. Yeah. And he, they would put some people on skim milk and they would even put some people on whey, which is the easiest to digest for me. So it's like even milk, you can separate that into what's, what's, uh, you know, what's the easiest form of milk? Can yeah, I you have it? goat milk and sheep milk, which has even smaller fat it, particles. Exactly, too. exactly. Um, yeah, and um, oh yeah, and one other thing uh, I see a lot of carnivore people do to injure their gut is, is eating too much, too much fat. And if fat is important, you need vitamin A, D, and, and K2. You need all those stuff. But if you look at fat digestion, it's, it's it's you make it's, bile it's it's got lip, lipase real, so many uh, enzymes it takes so long it's in, it's it's very tough so mm -hmm. just just be careful with eating too much fat like mm -hmm. eat you know don't don't be eating like lard with a spoon it's, and, and one I, other thing that we haven't mentioned that people need to understand is when you consume a large volume of food your body can only digest so much food at once. So if you have a giant amount of food sitting in your stomach, it just makes it easier for it to get to that pathogenic bacteria potentially. And, and speaking of eating too much fat and food volume, candida, yes, it, it subsists off sugar better, but have you tested candida's protein and fat consumption capabilities? Okay, yeah, I'm glad you asked that question. So I tested it on, so I, I took like butter, like a stick of butter, like a little thing of butter and I put it's like this big black mass of candida like you would want it like I wear like a mask when I touch it <laughs> and I threw it on the butter nothing yeah didn't didn't grow mm -hmm. if if it, if it would have grown the whole thing would have turned black it just mm -hmm. it just like sat there um same thing with cheese which is you know protein and 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 fat didn't really didn't really do anything um it, it really it, it explodes on glucose and starch 
it, it really needs it really needs the sugar in order to to go crazy. So that's that's why when people go on those low sugar diets, they they feel so great. Um, I mean, it's it's not like fifty percent. It's like you cut their growth down by like ninety five percent. Like they mm-hmm. they don't they don't move. Mm-hmm. Um, they're simple, basic organisms, and their fuel source is sugar. Like only advanced like carnivore animals really utilize fat like it's 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 kind of like up and I'm, I'm not an expert on that stuff but like just microbes don't grow on fat they just don't mm-hmm. um yeah, they need fat but they don't they don't grow on fat mm-hmm. just, they just it doesn't work they need glucose and protein those are their mm-hmm. two big growth growth things i think we've given people a pretty easy protocol, like generally guidelines on where to get started for whatever gut issues they're having. What would you say the most common issues people come to you are like, what are they telling you? And then what does it end up actually being? Are they correctly diagnosing themselves for whatever their problem is? You know, mostly it's, it's just overcomplicating it and not asking the right questions. It's, and you know, just, just, it's, it's so easy to get overwhelmed. You know, you have, someone telling you this and someone telling you that and you have to stay rooted in what am I doing to injure, injure my gut. Mm-hmm. That's, that's what you, that's, that is the most important thing you can ask yourself when you, when, when you get some sort of reaction because, and then you just have to slowly stop doing those things. Like I, I still make mistakes, you know, I'll go out and see a piece of cake and I'm like, all right, I got to eat that. Um, you know, I, I, I'm not a perfect Weston A price sell it. Um, but when I do eat bad foods, like so, say for example, like I, I'm like a person that has to have chocolate. Um, you know, I have dark chocolate in front of me and then I have white chocolate in front of me. Everyone's going to go, Oh, I'm going to eat the dark chocolate. That's it's uh, someone said it was healthy. There are, there's so many plant chemicals in dark chocolate that will mess you up. It's not funny. Mm-hmm. Like, if a bear eats dark chocolate, they will die. What makes you think you can eat dark chocolate? Like, so white chocolate has, it's, it's only made with the, the, the cocoa butter, which doesn't have a lot of fat. Yeah. The cacao fat. Yeah. yeah. So it doesn't have a lot of those anti-nutrients in it. Mm-hmm. So if you ate, so if you're going to cheat, you know, cheat smart. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if you're gonna eat bread, you know, don't eat healthy whole grain bread, eat white bread. You know, mm-hmm. the, the brand's not going to shred up your mm-hmm. digestive system. Um, and coffee is another one. Um, you know, there's different ways to brew coffee. Um, Yeah. Espresso is one of the least inflammatory probably. Yeah. I do a a latte ristretto, which is like half the coffee and then like a lot of milk, pasteurized milk, but you know, whatever. It's my cheat thing. And you know, French presses. Oh man, those are all, there's so like, there's so much coffee in it. It's, it's, it's cheating, you know, Mm -hmm. And, you know, doing the least amount of damage to your gut. Uh, just think about what am I doing to injure my gut? I, th- I think coffee is something we, we definitely should mention. And, and even, okay, yeah. cho- even chocolate itself, both of these foods, what people have to understand, and I've done videos on these is they're seeds of a plant. So they're very high in anti-nutrients. They're very high in inflammatory compounds. They're fermented. They're rotten. They're heated at high temperatures. They're oxidized. It's basically mm-hmm. one of the worst, most inflammatory things you can put in your body. Yep. Therefore, when you have cacao butter, when you have an espresso, where many negative components of these plant foods have been removed, mm-hmm. that's why you'll have less of a reaction to these foods. But as Mike said, you know, a bear, would you say a bear dies if it eats chocolate? Yeah. It's like a dog or a bear. They, they find bears dead in like Pennsylvania, like near the Hersey chocolate plant, like, because mm-hmm. they get in chocolate. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and you got to remember, like, if you, if you think about these foods, like from a natural context, like, um, like think about coffee. It's a, it's a cherry. Mm-hmm. So you ate the cherry and you threw the, the seeds out on the ground yeah. and maybe you use them medicinally every once in a while mm-hmm. for something. Um, you know, same thing with chocolate. And, and when they're saying that they're fermenting these things, they're, they're not really, they're just from, they're fermenting the fruit. They're really not fermenting. Oh the, no, they're not. Yeah, absolutely. Much. Right. It's just yeah, so, letting the fruit fall off the outside. Yeah. Yeah. So they're not exactly um, sprouting the seeds or anything. Yeah, there, there's one company that does that in, in New York. Um, 
eat cultured or something like that. You mm-hmm. should check them out. I've, I haven't been able to get a hold of it, but I'm curious to try it. But yeah, just focus on not injuring your gut. I know people are like, the, they watch my videos and they're like, you didn't tell us anything. Mm-hmm. I, after 10 years, like of me just trying random things and rammed in diets, like, you know, I could be doing carnivore perfectly for six months or something like that. And, you know, I, I still had issues. Mm-hmm. I just like random things. And it was just simply because I wasn't chewing my food or I was eating too much. It was like, it simply came down to like stupid, simple things like that. Mm-hmm. And just to hammer this point home, you know, stop looking at solutions. Stop asking other people what you should be doing. Stop troubleshooting. Take a step back. Analyze what you're doing. Analyze what you've done for the past few years. There's definitely something you're doing wrong. There's something everyone's mm-hmm. been doing wrong. So until you address those things that you've been doing wrong, And yeah, of course, you need a baseline. You need a base understanding, something like what we've been talking about to understand where you should be. But really make sure to address, you know, what could be wrong. And and the comparison you're making to is, what is the difference between my diet and the natural diet of an indigenous person? You know, where is the food I'm eating originating from? Yeah, another thing I see people do is like, they're like, oh, I have SIBO or oh, I have candida oh i have a special strain of candida you know oh i have e coli or something they're all they all behave the same way if you ask me they mm-hmm. all react they they if you put oregano oil essential oil they're they're all gonna die mm-hmm. you know and if you want to be safe you know use use some other herb you know you pick you have thousands mm-hmm. i i recommend you you pick a tropical one because plants in the tropics you know, they're in this very high environment where there's lots of fungus and stuff. So those plants have to make more chemicals. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's, it's, you know, you just have to stop injuring your gut and then reculture it. I mean, it's, it's really kill infection and reculture. It's really that simple when you keep it down into those things, not injuring and disinfect and reculture. It's, It's really that simple. Yeah, that probably makes sense why uh, Saccharomyces boulardii is, is good against candida because it's a tropical fungus. Uh, oh, really? Yeah, that's, that's, that's pretty interesting. Now, I personally follow a primarily carnivorous diet, but you know, throughout my dietary history, I, I do incorporate a lot of fermented animal foods. I have messed around with raw dairy, consuming milk and, and dairy products that do have a carbohydrate content, and I have incorporated honey into my diet you know, in various contexts. What is something that you suggest people should be doing on the carnivore diet that we're not really seeing? You know, those people that are just, you know, stuffing down conventional beef, bacon, eggs every single day. Whatever your goals are. And I know what it's like to first go on those meat-based diets and all your symptoms vanish. But I I, I believe most people, when they hit that one or two-year mark, they're going to need to start getting some sort of sugar into your mm-hmm. diet. I mean, gl- glucose, I mean, your body's converting protein into glucose. So if you're, if you're at that point where you want to start, you know, eating, eating plant foods, um, you know, and you know, that's what our ancestors were doing. You know, that's when we look at Weston A. Price's work, you know, really look at what you're doing to injure your gut. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I uh, you know, start getting, the infection under like you're in a really good place like being on the carnivore diet for you know a couple of months to a year is a really good place to start fighting infection reculturing your gut and then starting to bring in um mm-hmm. you know some tasty plant foods like mm-hmm. you can hate bread all you want but and, and hate on bread all you want but there's no doubting that it's delicious especially with some grass-fed butter mm-hmm. slathered on it like a sourdough yeah. sourdough bread and, and there's, there's, there's so much confusion around starches. I, I, um, I show, I, it's my belief our ancestors were not eating whole grains. They were eating pearled grains. They were finding ways to remove that bran. Um, or they so were heavily fermented, heavily, heavily fermented, heavily, heavily from, and I have, I like, I have, I'm a mad scientist with stuff. I, I, I super sensitive to bran. I, I can't tolerate like any bran. Mm-hmm. Um, unless it's like a fermented drink sort of a thing. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's, um, you know, you, you know, there's some people who are on the carnivore diet and, you know, they're happy with that. They want to eat raw meat and stuff like that for the rest of their lives. Fine. But I mean, you, if you want to live, you know, live in the normal world and be able to go out to eat with your friends and, 
you know, not be self-conscious about this huge steak or whatever. And, but you, you know, you can eat potatoes. It's, it's fine. Mm-hmm. You know, like there's, there's a way to eat potatoes safely. Um, so yeah, I, I could, yeah, I show people how to do that. Mm-hmm. I think one thing to understand is people look at glucose, starches, wheat, grains as bad things. And yes, there are potential negative components in the, the food. Like you said, you have a yeah. problem with bran, you react to certain things. But if you're able to reduce that anti-nutrient content, what you basically have is a base energy source for your body. And when you consume a yeah. starch, and, and honey is a good example of this. When you consume honey, what you're doing is you're feeding your body's energy stores and you're feeding your gut bacteria. Think mm-hmm. of starch, think of starch as fuel for your microbes. You know, don't think of, yep. you know, when, when you're consuming meat, when you're consuming organ meats, when you're consuming fat, quality seafood, think of that as the nutrients what you need to build your body. Think mm-hmm. of the fermented foods as what you need to build your gut microbiome. And then think mm-hmm. of the starches as what you need to feed that gut microbiome. So to keep your body healthy, to keep your gut microbiome healthy, it, it, may, it makes sense to have all of these components. And that's why when we look at Weston Price's indigenous groups, all of them consumed cooked food, raw food, fermented food, and plant foods. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, and I'm all about efficiency. And if your body is not getting glucose from its food, it's getting it from protein. And I don't know how many chemical reactions are involved in that. It's, yeah, you know, gluconeogenesis is stressful. It's not, yeah, it's it, not easy. So it's, it's much easier on your body to just eat glucose. Mm-hmm. And this um, depends greatly on, on your ancestry too. Uh, mo- most people, there's no one that's super efficient at gluconeogenesis. There are some people that are more efficient at utilizing fat but yeah. some people yeah. are probably like, like cold cultures. Yeah. 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 But someone Italian like me, mo- a lot of people, you know, in, in places where starch consumption has been high and, and even, you know, some of the most physically impressive groups of people in the world, the Maasai, the Nurs, mm-hmm. the South Sudanese, they had the presence of large amounts of animal foods in their diet. Yes. But they also got a lot of starch and a lot of tubers and a lot of energy yeah. calories. Yeah, Weston A. Price saw the Africans eating all sorts of starches. It just, it, it was kind of a mix up in Africa. He's, you know, they were, they, were, they had a, like a mix of modern and um, it kind of depended on where he visited. Um, yeah, but, it, and again, if you go look back to Mother Nature, we're very similar to carnivore, but we have that colon. We have that big colon compared to the other carnivores. And mm-hmm. I think that's for starch digestion. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there's really not a lot of other animals that, that have that, but, but all the anti-nutrients in starch, it's supposed to be there. And it's like a friend to us. Um, you know, that's how you store your grains for winter. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's a way it's natural preservatives because mm-hmm. when you eat the preservatives in our packaged foods, you're just sterilizing your gut mm-hmm. and causing all sorts of issues. So yeah, it, one, it's one example working of that with is, mother yeah. nature. Yeah. One example of that is the phytic acid. People don't know that phytates is actually phosphorus that's bound up. And our, yeah, body, our, yeah. body, needs, our body needs phosphorus just like it needs calcium, just like it needs magnesium. But yeah. it's bound up in this plant food. And it's, everything in nature has a purpose. And I was actually thinking, you know, Stan Efferding's vertical diet, you know, the, the premise of eating, I don't know if you're familiar, but he eats like red meat and it's red meat and rice based. And red I was meat thinking, only. Yeah, it's like, it's, well, it's red meat and rice. And I was like, well, honestly, you know, the premise is there. You know, you have the presence of nutrients from red meat and you have the presence of starch from white rice. But, uh-huh. you know, obviously you want to increase the food quality, you need to incorporate fermented foods. Uh, but out, out of all the diets that we see now, it's unfortunate that outside of the Weston Price diet, nothing really comes close to, to what we need for optimal human health. Yeah, and, and it's, and literally at the end of the day, like my diet, like, looks the same as it did when I was like a little kid. Like I elk bread and meat. It's like what I eat. And I'm trying mm-hmm. to get, I'm a, I'm a baby with organ meats. You know, I take my organ capsules, but you know, I love mm-hmm. liver pate. I love bone marrow. Brains ain't bad. Fried brains. Oh, fried brains. is Delicious. Breaded really brains good. is really good. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm a baby with, with organ meats, but I know I should eat more, mm-hmm. but you know, I'm just doing the best I can. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I eat, I eat normal foods. You know, mm-hmm. I, I should probably eat, more uh like i'm not i'm not a big fan of sauerkraut mm. stewed sauerkraut stuff's gross stuff's gross stewed I'm not sauerkraut is amazing is actually what's 
stewed in a meat stock or bone broth. That's it's good. I hate That's vegetables. That was delicious. Yeah. I was like, oh. Um, so yeah, it's just like all these, you know, there's a reason why plant foods and starch are like such a big parts of our culture. We've been eating them for a long time. And you, you have to be careful of what society has, has done to things and especially these past 50 years, but you know, everything is, we can potentially eat most things. I mean, just, just look at, just look at the animals that eat it in mother nature. Like what do they do? Um, mm -hmm. and it'll give you a lot of hints and mm -hmm. just use common sense and efficiency, efficiency, efficiency. Don't, mm -hmm. don't injure your gut. It's, it's just what you got to look for. Mm -hmm. Mike, I can't thank you enough uh, for joining me with this. And for those of you that are like, Oh, Frank, aren't you so dogmatic about the carnivore diet? Da, da, da. Unfortunately, there needs to be a lot of, you know, you have to be very forceful and very overwhelming mm -hmm. to, to get people to break out of that shell of what, because if you tell people, what we're saying today, oh, you know, it's okay if you eat this, that, or that, if you have a healthy gut microbiome, and people think they have a healthy gut microbiome, but they really don't. So, so a lot yeah. of it is educating people, getting them out of that, you know, kind of closed-minded mindset. Uh, so can you just, you know, let people know, you know, where they can find you, uh, what yeah. you've been up to lately, anything to look out for in the future? Yeah. And I, I just want to add on to what you just said. Like, you know, most people can eat McDonald's and they're totally fine. You know, there's a reason why if you, you know, most people on the carnivore diet, if they eat McDonald's, you know, they're going to feel like they're going to die. And it's yeah. because of numerous reasons, injury, mm -hmm. infection, yeah. stuff like that. So it's, you know, yeah. That so, is a huge yeah. contrast. That is a huge contrast. Some people will go on the carnivore diet, eat feedlot beef, gain 20 pounds and feel like shit. Other people will go on the carnivore diet, eat feedlot beef, go to McDonald's every day, and they'll, you know, be a world-class athlete. There's. Yeah. It's, it's, it's really. I mean, like most of the CrossFit athletes, I don't know if you look at their diet. It's like, it, oh, it's, it's terrible. It's, it's horrible. It's, but, yeah, they, yeah. <laughs> but their body is their guts aren't injured so mm -hmm. that they, they can digest that. So I can only imagine what monsters they would be if they ate like good food. Who knows? You know? So, but yeah, uh, I'm on um, YouTube. I release like two, two videos a day. Uh, not a day. Uh, I can't, can't do that. Two videos a week, but no, yeah. We're not and, up and to I, Eric Berg's status. That guy works. I, like crazy. Oh, oh Eric. Berg. He does three videos oh, a day, I think. That's insane. I can't do that. Well, he has a production um, team. We're on our own. Yeah, we're on our own on that one. So, yep, I do two videos a week. Um, yeah, I have a free ebook called 21 Nutrition and Healthwise. Um, just like 21, you know, modern things and even holistic lies and myths you run into um, for free on my channel. But, um, but yeah, yeah, just come check us out. We're heavily based in, you know, I'm not carnivore, but, um, you know, I do use a lot of carnivore principles and Weston A. Price is, you know, pretty much my Bible, uh, um, mm -hmm. and, and the laws of mother nature. Mm -hmm. I, I really, and avoiding injury and promoting healing. Those, mm -hmm. those are the things I really emphasize. And I really don't see any other gut healing diets focusing on avoiding injury, which is, you know, most people are like, ah, I want to get to the root cause you know, the root cause is injury. Mm -hmm. Like that's what it is. And that's what you have to, and I, and I you know, that's, that's, that's what I'm trying to teach mm -hmm. everybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We know there are some other protocols like gaps, FODMAPs, but uh, the level of success in those programs is just, uh, it's unfortunately, it's not for most people. Yeah. I, I, I borrow a lot of ideas and, and usually people run into issues when they start like, oh, grains are bad, but let's eat some nuts. They're, they're, the, same, biot they're the same thing. They're actually hardier than grains. Mm -hmm. And so that, that's where people, you know, they, they, hit that, they hit that stage where they're putting in nuts. And they don't know nuts is, you know, that is, has a very, it might not be the issue, but it has a super high probability of that that's going to be the issue. Yeah, it's, it's like someone might Google, oh, how do I get more calcium or iron? And Google says to get eat spinach, but spinach, yeah. the iron and the calcium is bound to oxalate. So a lot of what we're being told is like face value, paper value stuff that on paper, yeah. it looks like it's going to work. But yeah. if you actually understand what's going, it's like if someone is telling you, oh, this is how you make a million dollars and he works in construction and you've never worked in construction before, it sounds like a great idea. And then you have a master builder come over to you and he's like, no, that guy's an idiot. He doesn't know what he's talking about. So it's, it's yeah. really unfortunate that you can't understand every single element of everything. But that's why we're here. That's why we're trying to figure things out and trying to help you guys out. 
Um, and what's so, funny is, is this stuff is science. This stuff is not debatable. Like, no, it's not. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's like you can debate about how to make a nut easier to digest and, and what methods to make it easier to digest. But there's no debate on whether someone with an injured gut should be eating nuts. Yeah. No, there's, there's no debate it's on science. what happens when, when you consume lectins. They actually, they, they physically leak through the small intestine. Yeah. Your, your blood cells bind to them. This is a mechanism. This is like pouring water on a fire. This is not a yeah. hypothetical like, oh, well, if you eat spinach, your, your rates of heart disease are reduced. This isn't a hypothetical thing. This is literally something yeah, you we're can not physically replicate. With statistics and making stuff up. 100% of water patients drink, 100% of cancer patients drink water. Water yeah. causes cancer. It's like they're, they're doing stuff like that. It's mm -hmm. like totally insane. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, I love talking with you, Frank. It, it's like... Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we, I, we both see it from that same perspective, looking at Western A prices and indigenous cultures. And, yeah, and when, you, when, when, you bring up, when you bring up these conversations, even though we've both come across this information in the past, even just like the presence of the, the veg, vegetal stuff in the gut, like when we uh -huh. revisit that type of stuff, we realize, oh, that's really important. That's really significant stuff that is often overlooked. Uh, yeah, yeah. But uh, Mike, thanks again for uh, joining us. Uh, as, as he said, you guys can find him on his YouTube channel. I will link uh, that at the end here. And uh, if you guys do want to check out the other Perfected Health podcasts, we are on episode seven now, going slow and steady. Uh, if you guys have any recommended guests, any things you guys would like to see, uh, please do let me know. But thank you guys for joining us on this lovely Sunday. You guys enjoy the rest of your week. Let's say bye to everyone. Bye, bye everybody. Guys.